We have to kick it up a notch. Nice touch. Nice dress. Oh, no, no, it's gonna be hot. There was an abundance of quotes from the source material, William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, and a bonus quote from Romeo and Juliet, here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Here's much to do with hate. More with love. Can you explain your process of curating and integrating these quotes into set decoration and character lines? It was very hard. It felt like I was back in college or high school because I had to find specific quotes from the play that worked where we were going. So I had to kind of reverse engineer it. So it was a lot, a lot. I, I swear to God, I must have reread this thing 50 times, uh, the Shakespeare play, during the, during the editing of this movie to find an actual quote and to see if an actual quote worked. And then once I thought I had a quote, I realized actually that's not, that's a, that's a kind of a misquote from the actual source material. So it took a lot of time to kind of pull. And you're the, you're probably the only one that's ever going to realize that the first line is not from Much Ado About Nothing. And you would also be kind of shocked to hear that over 70% of the people have no idea where those quotes are from. Well, Romeo and Juliet is my favorite Shakespeare play, but I mean, you had some Cupid kills with arrows, some with traps, skirmish of wit, men were deceivers ever. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left That's to protest. Right. So I've only seen it once. I don't know if I missed some, but I'm going to see it again on opening weekend. So did you, did, there's, there's some that they say, and then there's some that's, that are on. The, and then there's also, there are, there are many other hidden Easter eggs, like the names of the boats. There's a lot of Easter eggs in here if you like Shakespeare. Now, as a fanatic <laughs> of modern literary adaptations, I have to ask, what aspects of Benedict and Beatrice did you pull from William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing? And what ways did you aim to make these characters your own? Ooh, that's a really good question. Well, I mean, the whole dynamic and the structure of the film is from Much Ado About Nothing, the characters, uh, the dynamics. So we definitely had a little bit of it, but then we found so much of our own through the characters as well. And you'll see like every character within it sort of has its own modern twist. name within it and everybody has their own sort of modern twist on it. But the hard part is updating Shakespeare is its own issue and then you have to, you know, update the rom-com in general. But still so, make it feel nostalgic. And... You know, and that's that's that was actually, I think, kind of the most interesting part is how do you make like a big theatrical rom-com that is like full of scope and full of heart and full of funny that people want to show up to the theaters and watch and um i don't know i think we did it oh yeah you really did you fully snapped i couldn't believe it <laughs> <laughs> i had high hopes and it was so yeah. much better than i thought it was going to be <laughs> oh, i've heard you say uh about your previous work that you have allowed actors a lot of room to put their input in for how they wanted to build characterization. Was this also the case for working with Glenn and Sydney? Yeah, so I would write scenes, you know, three or four scenes at a time, send them chunks, ch chunks of chunks of the scenes, keep writing, they'd talk back to me, I'd change it, we would rehearse. So by the time we actually got to the to the set, it was in their voices. And then we have, then we could and then we can mess around on the set and try new things and write new scenes. But it was a big part of again, you can't as a romantic comedy I don't believe you can hide behind a character for that long in a movie, for two hours of, two, of a guy and a girl, a girl and a guy, or a guy and a guy, whoever, with each other. It ends up being them. So the more I can make it them, the kind of better and, and better the movie would be, I felt. You often discuss your affinity for having characters being aware of pop culture references, story and genre tropes. But what I like about how you go about this is that you don't maliciously degrade source material in the process. I think some of the approach to meta in recent Hollywood tendencies has gone a little overboard. But is that a balance you're specifically aiming for of like poking fun in a way where you're having fun as opposed to making fun? I think when you when you poke fun or make fun of something, it's just a shared experience. And you have to like something enough, unless it's something absolutely terrible, but that that can't last that can't last very long. But if you keep talking about something, it's a shared it's a shared experience that you like and Commenting or referencing on something to me is the biggest form of flattery. So, you know, I didn't ever want to degrade any person's experience or degrade anyone's what they think something is because we're all, I might like something that you hate and you might hate something that I like. So it's trying to find something that we all kind of can agree is, is good. And that's, I mean, I think we can all agree that Shakespeare's Much Do About Nothing is pretty good. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and obviously everyone is familiar with the Titanic reference yeah, because right. of the fact that it's in the right. trailer. But um, I won't spoil specifics, but I just want to ask, were the handprints also a Titanic reference? You got that too. Kind of. Kind of. But yes, there was definitely... And those are actually her handprints. We did this properly. And some people are going to be, when they see the movie, they're going to, they, we've already had people say, you got the handprints wrong because they thought, but they're not. They're absolutely correct. And they're actually hers. And there's a little bit of a nod to her, to um, Titanic. Titanic me. Are they watching? Are they doing Titanic? Sydney, you're credited as an EP. Can you quickly share a little bit about what other responsibilities you had in addition to just performing your character? Yeah, so I actually, um, I had the script two years before, brought it to Glenn and was working on it, developing it and pitched it to Glenn for him to read. And he ended up liking it as well. And then brought on Will Gluck to direct and took it to Sony to sell it. Honey, look who's here! Who is it? My ex, Jonathan. My parents have been trying to get us back together. He's like a son to us. As a wedding date fan, I of course have to ask you to share your vision and approach to getting Dermot Mulroney in the movie and creating this really goofy paternal character. It was just such a playful take on Leonardo. And I was right, I guessed he would be Leonardo. Yeah, well who else would he yeah. have been? He's the original, he's the he's the romantic comedy OG, right? From and, and in fact. During the beginning of the movie, like the first week, we took the entire cast and sh and to a screening room, to a theater, and showed my best friend's wedding with with Dermot. It was the first time that Dermot had seen it, I think, since the, when it came out. And he got so emotional, and everyone got emotional, and then he basically gave this big speech that had everyone in tears and, and basically turned to Glenn, and he said, you know, let me tell you something about being in romantic comedies, that to people you represent love. So every time you walk around some some place, no matter what you thought of that movie, your love to people, and it was like this incredible. I, we thought it would just be a fun moment, but it was like this incredible emotional thing. And we're very and Dermot played a different character in this movie. He plays kind of a, a dad, right? The dad jokes. Yeah. 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 What the? I love how the film uses physical comedy to Trojan horse deeper insight into both of your characters. Can you explain your approach to maintaining the emotional continuity of your character arcs while you have to film these really over the top technical sequences of physical comedy? <laughs> I mean, I think that it's just fully embracing everything that you're doing at complete capacity every time. Yeah, you can't half-ass this thing. No, you have to be fully prepared. going into it. I think that was the best part about shooting this thing with Sydney. It was, it was very, very clear that Sydney and I, if we both didn't fully commit to all the things of this movie, if it I, worked. if I, you know, especially like on on days where you have to like again like the spider scene where I'm like ripping my clothes off, I'm like, thank God I had a partner that legitimately was like okay, equally as willing to make herself look dumb and stupid. I mean, I definitely come out looking the dumbest and stupid in this movie, but 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 Sydney was equally there as a partner and it made every day a freaking blast. I really love the film's physical comedy, but even more so how it's used as a vehicle to reveal things about the characters. How did you conceptualize interweaving outlandish comedic sequences with peeling back Ben and B's emotional layers. Because the only time I think that when stuff is very physically funny in real life, you're laughing because you like the person or because you know why it's funny to the person. So in all the, the physical kind of set pieces we had with Sid and Glenn, it exposed them and made Glenn kind of, it, it knocked down Glenn's armor a little bit. And for Sid, it showed you in the very beginning that she wasn't all put together. So it's all, all this stuff that, that, that shows the characters' true colors while they're trying to play it off that it's not. And that, to me, is the, the funniest moments. And, and it would only have worked if Sid and Glenn were just so good at that and, and, and so natural. Pretty long flight. Do you want anything from the front of the boat? I'm all good on creatine and small thick insecurity. Nothing small about me. What the? Glenn, this version of Benedict feels really fresh compared to other male rom-com leads because you have this juxtaposition of a fuckboy persona with really endearing vulnerabilities and realistic flaws. Can you share your approach to maintaining that undercurrent of vulnerability even when you're playing Ben's fuckboy bravado? Yeah, I think like in terms of in terms of uh, 
the masks that people wear. I think that's literally what this movie's about. It's like we build up this armor to to protect ourselves from the world. Ben's, you know, lost his mom, you know, arguably is his best friend and he doesn't want to love again because he doesn't want to lose someone that he really cares about. And this movie's about self-protection and real love is about diving in even though you think you can be hurt. Um, and, and I think that's the true essence of rom-coms. It's, it's guarded people exposing their hearts on film. That's it. Yeah. And what you did with Ben in particular, I found really interesting because I fully expected the fuck boy bravado, but then you juxtaposed it with all these really endearing flaws and vulnerabilities. Can you give more of an insight into how you went about adapting Shakespeare's Benedict with all of this nuance added into it? Yeah. I mean, I mean Benedict, even from Shakespeare and in our our Ben, is an he's an asshole. He's 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 an asshole. He's a jerk, right? And especially in the Shakespeare play, I mean he, you know, the the entire much ado about nothing, the theme should be just believe women because they don't believe one woman in that entire play, right? So if anyway, that's a whole different issue. But if you get someone like Ben who in our movie is a fuckboy and an asshole, once you realize that it's just a complete facade and it's just a front, then you start to understand and you want to pull him out and say, stop being that guy, stop being that guy. And, and, and that's what we did with all his kind of, the more douchey you made him, the funnier it is when you realize, oh my God, this is not who this guy is. He's, he's putting on an act. Now, Benedict never really turn like that in Shakespeare. He never really flipped as much as that, but that's because Shakespeare. Bad idea, right? What did we miss? What did we miss?